Welcome to our gathering at Hope Church. We're honored that you're joining us today. At Hope Church, we exist to connect people to live the life of a Jesus follower in Las Vegas, the West, and the world. We hope you enjoy the service. Guys, it's almost over, right? <laughs> I mean, almost. I'm not talking about this service. I'm talking about this season, all right? Man, these election cycles are getting more and more stressful every single time. When I was in high school, I had an amazing teacher who taught U.S. history. In one particular week, she took a whole week of the class to talk about United States presidential debates. It was actually pretty cool. Um, And she talked to us, she led off with the first televised presidential debate that happened in 1960 between John F. Kennedy and Richard Nixon. Now, I'm not going to ask anybody in the room if you remember that because you'll just date yourself, okay? But um, she explained to us that Kennedy's team figured out quickly the strategy of the televised debate. They decided that it was all about aesthetic, physical posture, and tone. For aesthetic, they knew that the debate would be seen on TVs all over the country. But here's what they also knew. Those TVs were in black and white. No color television back then. So aesthetically, they figured out that if Kennedy wore a light blue shirt under his dark suit... Rather than a white one as normal, that it would be more appealing to the eye on a black and white television. And they also encouraged him to wear makeup like the television actors and movie stars would wear. And so he did that. And then they encouraged him that the physical posture and tone could now be seen by people rather than simply heard on the radio. In fact, every other presidential debate before this was on the radio. But this is the first time people were seeing the physical posture of the candidate. So the Kennedy team stressed for, for, the, for Kennedy to have a kind tone and posture. Well, Richard Nixon... He wore a gray suit with a white shirt, and it seemed to blend into the background on a black and white television. He also chose to wear very little makeup because he didn't think it was a big deal. He also stuck to his policies in a very black and white, matter-of-fact way that came off condescending at times. In fact, one of the most uh, discussed issues with the 1960 presidential debate was the notion that people who listened to the radio were more likely to vote for Nixon and people who watched the debates on television were more likely to vote for Kennedy. We then began to talk about all of the other United States presidential debates and the strategies of those. And largely, the debates of the past were met with a certain amount of respect and dignity as the two candidates spoke with each other. In fact, they were, they were often done in front of live studio audience who remained silent. There were no muted microphones. There were no fact-checking moderators. They had these green, yellow, and red lights on their podiums. And the most either of them talked over the red light was about 10 seconds as they had a spirited and respectful civil debate for 90 minutes. Well, things sure have changed. (laughs) Today we live in a world where political conversations like this just don't exist anymore. They are now more about tearing down the other side than working together for the good of the country. There's more hostility than respect, more talking than listening, more division and less unity and working for good. Unfortunately, this new way of debating is not just reserved for television debates or advertisement or commercials. It can also be done in our own families. 
our own workplaces, our schools, our social media posts, even within the church, even within a faith family, there can be hostility, more hostility than respect for one another, more talking than listening, more division and less unity. And that's all part of what led us to teach through this sermon series, Citizens and Exiles, remembering who we are and whose we are. And I don't have time to fully explain the heart and the aim of this series, but uh, if you were not here with us last week, I would encourage you to go back online, look at our YouTube channel and catch up. Because I laid out about a 20-minute introduction to last week's message, really unpacking my heart and my burden and love as a pastor of this church that loves you and desires you to remember who we are and whose we are. Who we are, we're part of the family of God. We do things a certain way. We have certain values and we live with intentionality in the way of Jesus because we're a part of God's family. So we should act a certain way. Whose we are, we are sons and daughters of the King of Kings. If you have a relationship with God through Jesus, you are a son or daughter of the King of Kings. And Jesus has saved you, he sealed you, and now he's now sending you out to tell people who don't know about God's love for them. That God loves them and wants a relationship with them. We should never forsake that. And we should never forget that. Even when we're in the midst of an election cycle. And even if we disagree politically. Last week, we jumped into this series by grounding ourselves in a powerful truth. Look at it on the screen. Our primary identity is as a citizen of the kingdom of God. Amen. But here's the truth. I mean, it doesn't take long for us to realize we don't currently live in that kingdom yet, do we? We live here now. In a world that's chaotic, divided, loud. So what are we to do in a land that's not our home, where we currently are right now? The good news for us is that the word of God is full of pictures just like this. God's people often found themselves living in places that were not their home. The Bible calls them exiles. An exile is someone who has been displaced to a land that is not their home. And these kinds of people were actually the recipients of this letter that we're in in 1 Peter. Look at 1 Peter 1, 1 again. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Listen, to those who are elect exiles. Peter is saying here that you were chosen by God and where you are right now is not your home. You are elect exiles. And Peter was telling them, remember who you are and whose you are. What about us? Like for followers of Jesus, the idea of exile can also be understood spiritually speaking. Because here's the truth. As Christians, we are called to live in this world. But we are not what? Of this world. This city, this state, this country, this is not our true home. Our true citizenship is in God's kingdom. Yet, while we wait for the full realization of that kingdom, we still got to live in this foreign land, right? With its cultures and systems and politics, striving to be faithful to God in our relationship with him in the midst of it all. So what does that look like? That's what we're going to be focusing on today. As followers of Jesus, we are citizens of the kingdom of God called to be faithful exiles in a country. So, well, great. That's a great statement, Jeff. What does that look like? Can I just say what it looks like? Hard. That's what it looks like. It's hard. Navigating all of this as Jesus followers, man, this is hard. Today, we're going to step into the tension of the hard Today, again, I'm not going to tell you who I think you should vote for. Once again, I realize that for many of you, I'm sure I'm not going to say enough to please you, okay? But once again, hear my heart. My role is not to please you. 
My role is to please my Father in heaven. And my role is to take his word, open up his word, and let's see what God has to say to us. All right? So how do we live as citizens of God's kingdom, our primary allegiance, while being engaged, responsible citizens of the United States that receives our lesser allegiance? How do we live as faithful exiles in the land God has placed us? Just like last week, what I want to do for the rest of our time is to focus on 1 Peter chapter 2. Last week we were in verses 9 and 10. Pick us up again right here in verse 11 of 1 Peter 2 on the screen. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God in the day of visitation. Now, remember from last week, right before this passage, Peter lays out some glorious realities for us as the people of God, right? He calls us chosen, a royal priesthood, holy, a people of his own possession. I mean, we are citizens of a kingdom that will never fail. But now Peter says in verse 11, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to do a few things. The word urge means to plead with, to beg. And he begins to give us some ways we can be faithful exiles. Let's look at the first way. Fight our flesh. Look at verse 11. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, flesh which wage war against your soul. Peter's reminding us here what the Bible's been saying on repeat. Look at what Paul says to the church at Ephesus in Ephesians 6, verse 10. He says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. If you have a relationship with God through Jesus, our sins have been paid for and forgiven. However, on this side of heaven, our flesh and our sin nature are very much alive. All right, some of you looked at me really holy. Let me just say it this way. My flesh and my sin nature is very much alive, all right? I don't know about the rest of y'all. I, I'm going to say it is, all right, for all of us. But this flesh, this sin nature, this thing that opens us up to the temptation of sin is still alive and well, unfortunately. And it's our flesh that the enemy, with all of his schemes and tricks and strategies, begins to tempt and attack our flesh. And we're living in a country that wants to make people or a political party our enemy. But what Peter says right here, before he says anything about earthly authorities or government, he's getting there, I promise. But he says this, there is a war going on, and that war is going on inside of you. And it's the enemy tempting your flesh to sin. And he's saying, fight it. Fight it. How? How do we fight it? By pressing in to our kingdom citizenship as a son or daughter of King Jesus and putting on the full armor of God. Paul says it like this to the church in Rome. Look at Romans 13 verse 14. He says, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. So let me ask you this question. How well are we fighting our flesh? Let me go deeper. Where in this season have we made provision for the flesh? And what we say on social media and how we speak about people that we disagree with. Can I just tell you this? On Tuesday, you're going to have to fight your flesh. Hopefully, shameless plug, you'll come here on Tuesday night for our first Tuesday prayer and worship night. <laughs> Gather in this room from 6.30 to 8. Let's fight our flesh together. Amen. 
But you're going to watch these election results rolling in, and you're going to be tempted to say, what is happening? I mean, how can the people of our country be so blind? You're going to be tempted to say, somebody must have rigged the whole thing. That's your flesh. You're a citizen of the kingdom of God first. So watch your flesh. Peter says, fight your flesh. He also says to live different as ambassadors of God. Look at verse 12. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Peter says here, keep your conduct, your behavior, your living Keep that honorable among the Gentiles so that, in other words, here's why I'm saying this, that even when they speak against you, they may see your good deeds and glorify God. You know, this word Gentiles here in the Greek refers to people who did not yet have a relationship with God. For context, remember this letter, the first Peter, was written to exiled Jews, right, who became followers of Jesus. So Peter is saying, live different in the presence of the Gentiles, these people who are far from God, these people who do not yet have a relationship with God, live different around these people so they will see you act in the midst of hate and they will say, you know what, there's something different about these people. And this can be so convicting to all of us, right? Because instead of fighting our flesh and living different, we can often live in our flesh and fight the same way as everyone else who doesn't have a relationship with God. Man, this text, you ever had these texts, right? They just crawl up in your lap and just point their finger at you. That's what this text is doing. I don't know if it's for you, but it's doing that for me. It's pointing its finger saying, hey, you... Because in the midst of our cultural craziness, people who don't know Jesus, they may know what I'm against. But do they see my honorable behavior that makes me different? And makes them ask, why are you different? They may know where we align politically. But do they know that no matter what life throws at us, our hope is ultimately in the kingdom of God. Peter is really saying here what Jesus taught him, right? Look at Jesus' challenge to all of us to live as exiles. Look at Matthew 5, verse 14. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. This is a call for kingdom citizens to be faithful exiles, to live different, to show honor, respect, even in the midst of persecution, hardship amongst people who don't know Jesus. It's a call for us, you and I, to be an ambassador. You know what an ambassador is? It's an official who works and lives in a foreign country who represents their country and officially speaks on behalf of their country. So, for example, the United States ambassador to France lives in France and officially speaks on behalf of the United States to the country of France. As Christian exiles living in the foreign land that's called the United States, we must realize we are God's ambassadors. Look at 2 Corinthians 5 verse 18. Paul says to the church at Corinth, all this is from God, who through Christ reconciled. That word reconciled means to be brought back. God, uh, through Christ, God brought us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. So now we have this ministry. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling, bringing back the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting, listen, to us, that's believers, the message of reconciliation. Therefore, because of all that we just heard, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal Through us, we implore you on behalf of Jesus Christ, be reconciled to God. 
for our sake. God, he, God, made him, Jesus, to be sin who knew no sin, so that in Jesus we might become the righteousness of God. We are his ambassadors. As long as we live on this planet, anywhere we live, in any country on earth, we speak of God's love to everyone, wherever we are, on behalf of God and his kingdom, because we are citizens of his kingdom. So why do we need to live different as ambassadors of God? Can I just let you in on something? Because people who don't follow Jesus act like people who don't follow Jesus. We need to love them, show them who God is. And we cannot expect unrighteous people to act righteous. But you know what? We can expect righteous people to stop acting so unrighteously. And that's exactly what Peter's saying here. For the sake of those who don't know Jesus, live different as ambassadors for God. A 19th century Scottish pastor, Alexander McLaren, said it this way. The world takes its notions of God, most of all, listen to this, from the people who say they belong to God's family. They read us a great deal more than they read the Bible. Another person said it like this. Your life may be the only Bible that some people may ever read. Our greatest apologetic isn't us telling people how wrong they are. Our greatest apologetic is showing people that we are all wrong. We're hopeless. And Jesus is the only way that we can be right. So here's a gospel reality. We don't get into the kingdom by our behavior. But by our behavior, we show people what the kingdom is. a gospel reality because the good news of Jesus is that I could never earn my way to salvation. I can never work my way to salvation. I can never behave in any way that would somehow make me worthy of salvation. Jesus and he alone did everything necessary to save me and my behavior played no part in that. Praise God. The God that saves me The God that saves us now sends us into the world to be a shining city on a hill, to be his ambassador. That's how he desires to grow the kingdom. This passenger, this passage goes on to continue to challenge us. And where it's headed is where I've been praying for the most. (laughs) Because what I'm about to read is hard. For a lot of us. And I've been praying hard that we would hear this with an understanding heart. Number three, we must understand our context. First Peter chapter 2, verse 13 says this: Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme. Or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. Now, if you knew the political and cultural situations that this letter was written in, in 1 Peter, what he just said would shock you. Even verse 17, honor everyone, love the brotherhood, honor the emperor. You know who the emperor was when he was writing this? Nero. Nero is an emperor who is notorious in history for his cruelty and erratic behavior. I mean, this is crazy if you think about it. I mean, let me give you a little snapshot of some of Nero's evil. He was unashamed in how he persecuted Christians. Many were tortured, crucified, or burned alive. In fact, the legend has it that he would often light the pathway to his palace by impaling Christians and lighting them on fire as human torches. He murdered his mother, Agrippina. Why? Because she became too political and posed a threat to his authority. 
He also killed not one, but two of his wives. Oh, and by the way, church history tells us that Peter himself, the guy who wrote 1 Peter, was crucified upside down under an emperor, Nero. Think about this. Peter just said, honor the person who will order my execution. We thought we had it hard here. It doesn't say agree with the emperor. It doesn't even say like the emperor. It says to honor the emperor. I told you this is hard. This is a convicting word. And I know we don't live in first century Roman Empire and we don't have a Nero running around here. But as I said last week, I am so grateful that God saw fit for us to live in this country, this democratic republic where we are free to choose our leaders. This is why we don't, as believers, put our heads in the sand and we take all that God's word has said for us as we relate to government and we trust him with our civic responsibilities as exiles here in the United States. And whether you like our current leaders or our future leaders or not, our national authority, our state officials, our local leaders, the question is put before us, are we honoring them? You see, here's the truth. Peter's not some bygone hippie who's saying irrelevant things. No, this is the living, active word of God. It's for us today. And God is telling us to stop falling prey to political landmines as faithful exiles who understand this world is not our home. We are to honor our leaders. But this is hard. Because of the Holy Spirit in us, though, we can disagree. We don't have to disrespect. We don't have to we don't have time to fully unpack all that's here, but I want to help us with three really helpful things for us as exiles as it pertains to governing authorities. And I want to be sensitive here, okay? Because here's what I know. In our country's history, the passage that we've just read and what we're talking about have been used as weapons to control and manipulate in the past. And I've prayed that even if you've heard this passage taught as man's abuse to bully, that you hear this passage today as God's love for us to flourish. There's three ways we relate to governing authorities. Number one, we trust God who established governing authorities. 1 Peter 2.13 says, Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme. That word every means every. (laughs) It means all. There's not a lot of room for interpretation with the word every. There's a lot of room for emotion with the word every. That's hard to hear. The word institution here in the Greek means something founded or created. This word always occurs in the New Testament in connection with God's creative activity. You know what that means? That God himself creatively established the principle of governing authority. It was God's idea and how we relate to what he created is a big deal. So we trust God who established governing authorities. Number two, we are to submit to the governing authorities. Look at verse 13. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme. That word be subject means in the Greek to willingly place oneself under the authority of. Well, why should I do that? Look at verse 15. For this is the will of God. That by doing good, you should put to silence there against the foolish people. For this is the will of God. So it's the will of God for us to submit to every human institution. Hear my heart, hear my heart, hear my heart, okay? This means it applies to our situation even if we don't like the results of the election. Whoever is elected, be subject. Why? Why should we be subject? 
Because the reality from God's word is that he gave authority in our lives to protect and guide us. So I am to submit to God by submitting to those authorities God has given me. Now, I'm not saying that we submit to authority when it calls us to act in a way that's contrary to God's word. In those cases, we have a higher authority. As kingdom citizens, we submit ultimately to him. It's called civil disobedience. It happened actually in the book of Acts chapter 5. The religious leaders of the day commanded the disciples to stop sharing the gospel. And the very disciple who wrote 1 Peter, Peter, in our text today, he answered in Acts 5, 29. Look at the screen. But Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than men. And there are some of you right now going, yeah. So I'm talking about rise up. When we are commanded by the government to do something that is in contradiction to God's word, or when we are commanded by the government to not do something that is commanded in God's word, we must, hear me, graciously resist the government. I know some of y'all. I said resist, and you were like, resist? That means overthrow, right? It does not mean that. No, we humbly resist, knowing that God is in control. Remember when Peter tried to resist that one time? Remember that in the garden? They come to arrest Jesus, and Peter tries to resist what he's doing. Shing, right? Takes out that sword, and he cuts off Malchus's ear, and Jesus is like, whoa, 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 whoa. Peter, put that thing away, man. It's not what we're doing. We graciously resist the government if that happens. But in every other case, God's word calls us to submit. Now, here's the truth. Submitting to the governing authority is not me having faith in my government, okay? It's me having faith in God as I submit to his creative design to give us governing authorities so that I can trust him because I belong to him. Now, John Piper is a pastor in Minnesota. You say, Jeff, why did you say that? Because you're going to hear his Minnesota in this, te- in this quote, okay? All right? So you're going to hear it. When you hear it, you'll go, oh, yeah, there it is. Okay? But listen to this quote. We are his God's servants. He owns us. We do his bidding. And when the human state tells us to pay our taxes and keep the speed limit and shovel the snow off of our sidewalks, we do it. Not because the state is our authority, but because God is. We submit for his sake and in his limits. Let me ask you this question. What if the way that we submit to and honor the governing authorities is actually a reflection of how we submit and honor God. I mean, this seems to be the heart of Romans 13, right? Look at Romans 13, verse 1. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And those authorities that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. I mean, this may seem foreign to us, but it shouldn't be. In the midst of some of the most brutal persecution, Jesus' followers in the New Testament were called to submit to the governing of the authorities as an extension of their submission to God. This is challenging for us. So we trust God who established governing authorities. We submit to the governing authorities. Number three, we're to honor the governing authorities. Verse 17 says, honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. That word honor describes a continuous action of esteeming honor to the office as an authority established by God. Continuing. He says, everyone. Yes, that's every single person. He says, love the brotherhood. Who's that? Love every believer, whether they voted like you or not. He says, fear God, honor God, respect, consider him worthy. He says, honor the emperor. 
you know, here's the truth. Where submit speaks to the actions of my life, honor speaks to the attitudes behind those actions. We see this as parents, right? Like when you tell your kid, you know, like, hey, your chore, take out the garbage. Please take out the garbage. And you see your kid go, ah. And they go and they bang around and they take the garbage and they pull it out of the can and they slam the door behind them and you hear them throw it into the can and the outside and they come back in and sit on the couch and cross their arms and like, they obeyed. (laughs) They submitted to what you asked them to do. But honor takes it a step further than submitting, right? Right? Honor requires not just our actions, but it's our attitude behind the actions. You ask them to take out the garbage and they say, oh, yeah, my bad. Thanks for reminding me. And they go and they take it out and then they take it outside gently and come back in and put a new bag in the can and and sit down and don't say a word. That's honor. It's different. This is where we need God to intervene in our hearts because here's the truth. If we're going to honor our leaders, it's impossible to do it in our flesh, isn't it? I mean, this is where we trust the Holy Spirit of God as Jesus followers to do what we can't do. It requires God dependence. Maybe you're thinking, but these people are so evil and so wrong. I know. I feel it too. As I look at some of the policies and agendas being propagated today, I'm provoked, man. My flesh can start to rise up. And that's where I need to zoom out quick. As we talked about last week. Here's the truth. We can hate ideas and ideologies, but love the people who hold them. You've heard the old saying, right? Hate the sin, love the sinner. You know where we got that? Jesus. Matthew 5, 44. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Think about that. Man, here's another convicting word. If Jesus followers spent as much time praying for our government as we do complaining about it, how much different would would our country look? And I'm guilty as charged. The Bible gives us a very clear directive on how we are to relate to governing authorities. We may not like it, but God's word is clear. So why? Why should we submit to these governing authorities? I mean, why should we do it? I mean, striving to be faithful to God in the midst of it all, why should we do it? Well, it's because we need to follow Jesus' lead as it relates to being faithful exiles in this land that God has placed us in. When my family and I moved to Canada in 2010, we actually felt like being like exiles for the first time. You know, sometimes I want to walk around and go, some of y'all have never lived in another country and it shows, all right? (laughs) But we actually felt like exiles in another country. We had to learn a lot about that country to be able to understand how to live there. First of all, Canada is a constitutional monarchy, which means they answer to the King of England. So and it, when we lived there, it was the Queen of England. But the money all had pictures of the Queen and other past English monarchs. And although the government wasn't a socialist government, it operated similar to a socialist government because of its comprehensive social welfare programs and public services. So much so that our income tax was almost 40%. A little over 38% was our income tax. Now that helped pay for everyone's free health care and, wealth and welfare checks. We had to realize that. Just a couple of months after we arrived in Canada, the public school where both of my children attended flew the rainbow flag over the school on their school flag pole for Pride Month. I had friends of mine that lived in Canada with us who visited San Francisco, and they came back from their trip to San Francisco shocked by how conservative of a city it was. And we quickly found out that the values of the city and the country that we were living in were quite a bit different than our biblical worldview. So how did we live in that country? Was it easy? No. But why did we do it? Is it easy to live as faithful exiles right here? No. But why do we do it? Because Jesus did it. And he desires us to do it right here as exiles in this land. 
We fight our flesh. We live different as God's ambassadors. We understand our context. And number four, we follow Jesus' lead. Look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21 in the New Living Translation. It says it this way, For God called you to do good, even if it means suffering. Listen, just as Christ suffered for you, he is your example, and you must follow in his steps. He never sinned nor ever deceived anyone. He did not retaliate when he was insulted, nor threaten revenge when he suffered. He left his case in the hands of God who always judges fairly. He personally carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. By his wounds, you are healed. Once you were like sheep who wandered away, but now you have turned to your shepherd, the guardian of your souls. This is how Jesus responded to the government. So when we lived in Vancouver, that's how we decided to live. Surrendered to Jesus, seeking to live as he lived. And we are to live like that right here. In the face of being exiled, exiles in another land. As Jesus followers whose citizenship is in heaven. Whose greater allegiance is to the kingdom of God. As those living in exile right here in a place that's not our home. We are to follow Jesus' lead. How do we do it? It's lined out for us in those verses. Number one, we desire to live holy. 1 Peter 2, 22, Jesus never sinned nor ever deceived anyone. In the context of this election season, we seek to live holy and never deceive anyone with our lives. It's what we talked about earlier. We are to fight our flesh as the enemy continues to tempt us. We are to fight our flesh. How do we follow Jesus? Number two, we desire to not retaliate when we are insulted because of Jesus. Look at what Jesus said, or what Peter said about Jesus in the first part of verse 23. He did not retaliate when he was insulted, nor threaten revenge when he suffered. During this election season, when our biblically based values are insulted, we don't retaliate or threaten revenge. Jesus didn't, Peter didn't, we should not. Number three, we trust God fully. Look at the second part of verse 23. Jesus left his case in the hands of God who always judges fairly. We completely trust God with this election no matter who wins. And in that we should not be afraid. I mean, there are a lot of Christians who look at these candidates and think there's no way I'm not voting. In fact, a new study by the Barner Group discovered that upwards of 40 million Christians are planning not to vote. 40 million. If that's you today, I want to urge you to reconsider because we have a civic responsibility in the Democratic Republic to, f- to find ourselves to choose our leaders. So one of the ways we make our voices heard is through voting. We can't sit this one out. We're not promised by God the democratic freedom we have. It's a privilege that we should not take for granted. Part of being a good citizen of the kingdom in exile is exercising our right to vote. And I've talked with many, many, many of you. And I know many of you have already cast your vote. And that's awesome. But if you haven't, I encourage you to get alone with the policies of each candidate. Open up the Bible and pray. Here's the thing. Amen. Because we need to see, listen, past the popularity contest and see the policies behind the personalities. Personalities will come and go. The policies that that governing authorities put in place often last far beyond the person. And as we already know, you know what lasts far beyond all of that? The Word of God. It's timeless. Stands for all eternity, way beyond any policy or political candidate or official, stands the word of God. So pray, research, read his word, vote according to and with the leading of the Holy Spirit in your life and according to God's word. But hear me, but after all the votes are counted, we can and need to trust God fully with the results. Number four, we follow Jesus' lead by believing in the gospel. Look at verse 24. He personally carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. 
by his wounds you are healed. Here's what we believe as Jesus followers. The gospel is the only answer to any of this chaos going on in our country. It is the only answer. And the gospel is what unites us together as Jesus followers. This division within the body of Christ over politics is heartbreaking and it's frustrating. And because of the flesh in us and the spiritual enemy we all have in the devil, we have to be on guard against division that's trying to raise up in the church. Jesus prayed for the unity of all believers in John 17. He said that in the same way that he and the Father are one, that we may be united as Jesus followers as one. Our unity is not just for our sake, but so that the world may believe in Jesus. That's how Jesus told us that they would know his love. And that should be enough reason in and of itself to be unified around the gospel. John 13, 35 says this, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples. How? If you have love for one another. Most of the time when people divide over issues like politics, hear me, it's because we confuse unity for uniformity. Uniformity implies a lack of diversity where individuals are identical in thought, behavior, and opinion. Unity is the coming together of diverse individuals. Look around. This is the coming together of diverse individuals. And we share a common bond despite our differences. See, Jesus didn't pray for uniformity. He doesn't call us to be clones. He calls us to be brothers and sisters in Christ, diverse in culture, thought, convictions, and even political opinions. But united by the gospel of Jesus Christ. So here's the thought. If you find out that someone voted different than you, differently than you as a follower of Jesus, love them. Can I say this? If you find out I voted differently than you, will you love me? Why? Because what unites us is the gospel and not an election. We are first and foremost kingdom citizens that will be together for all eternity. So let's give each other some grace. Finally, we are protected by Jesus. Look at verse 25. Once you were like sheep who wandered away, but now you have turned to your shepherd, the guardian of your souls. Here's the thing. When the chaos that we're experiencing right now seems to be closing in all around us, zoom out. And we should zoom out and we should turn to our shepherd who's the guardian of our soul. So no matter who wins the election on Tuesday, let me tell you some things that won't change. God is still on the throne. We are his children. We are a family and he is in control. We are part of a kingdom that will never fail. And while we wait for the king to come again, we live as faithful exiles in this land under the protection of our shepherd who is the guardian of our souls. So let us all, as the people of Hope Church Henderson, remember who we are and whose we are. Paul David Tripp said it this way, you must remind yourself that you are the citizen of another kingdom. Your king rules over everything that would discourage and disappoint you. And he rules for your good in his glory. What is out of your control is under his rule. What you don't understand is under his careful administration. Long after the kingdoms of this world have been destroyed, you will reign with your king in his kingdom forever and ever and ever. Amen. As we respond today, for the Jesus followers in the room, how well are we fighting our flesh? Where in this season have we made provision for the flesh? Are we prepared for this week to know we're going to have to fight our flesh? Let me ask you this question. Do we desire to retaliate when we're insulted because of Jesus? Do we trust God fully 
knowing that from before the beginning of time, he already knew who was going to win this little bitty election. Do we believe the gospel is what unites us together as Jesus followers and not anything else, including an election? Will you put yourself today under the protection of our shepherd, who is the guardian of our souls during this chaotic season of our lives? If you don't have a relationship with God through Jesus today, know that God loves you. And there's, like I said earlier, there's nothing that any of us could ever do. You can't earn your way to salvation. You can't work your way to salvation. You can't even act good enough to be worthy of salvation. God loves you. He's done everything necessary to have a relationship with you. And he wants to begin a relationship with you today. If you'll admit you're a sinner, repent of your sins, believe God's love for you, and then to confess him as the Lord of your life, he wants to begin a relationship with you today. I'm going to do something a little different as we prepare to respond. I want us to read and proclaim together as a church the preeminence of King Jesus, the one who is on the throne and is not up for election. And I want us to read who our king is. We're going to do that. I'd just like for us to stand together. We're going to read together out of Colossians chapter 1, beginning with verse 15 says this, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by Him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through Him and for Him. And He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. That's our king. That's who we worship. And all praise and honor goes to our King. You may need some prayer today. We're going to have part of our prayer team up here. We'd love to pray for you. Maybe you need to come to these steps and just surrender and just get alone before God. But we're going to sing this song, All Hail King Jesus. And I would love for us together in unity to worship the King of Kings who's not up for election. He's the King who will never fail. Holy Spirit, lead us today as we respond. Lead us as we worship. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.